So our sermon today is on this topic of generosity. And, uh, you know, generosity is what fuels everything that I'm talking about up to this point. If we don't have a culture of generosity in our midst, we're not going to be a people that is making more time and more talent and more resources, financial resources available for that which God wants to do. You know, generosity is powerful, so today I want to talk about the power of generosity. Uh, Generosity uh, has a truth attached to it that I want you to know and I want you to learn about. And, And then lastly, there's a secret to generosity that I want to unlock for you today, okay? So first, the power of generosity. Why is generosity powerful? You know why generosity is powerful? Generosity is power because generosity is contagious. I don't know if you're paying attention to the reading of the word um, as Charlie was reading to us from this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 9. Uh, 2 Corinthians is a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote this letter uh, to a church that he had planted in the city of Corinth in Greece. And the reason why Paul writes these words in this specific chapter that we read is because Paul is desiring to activate the generosity of the church in Corinth towards the needs of the believers in Jerusalem. He's writing to Christians in Greece saying, look, there is a need in Jerusalem. Your brothers and sisters in Jerusalem are going through a famine. Those who are of the same family of God that you have come to belong through Jesus Christ, they are in dire needs right now, and I want you to be generous towards that need. And one of the things that Paul does in order to activate that generosity, if you were paying attention to the reading, is he gives them the example of another church that heard of that need in Jerusalem and was activated in generosity to meet the needs of the believers in Jerusalem. He talks about the church in Macedonia, which geographically was not that far from the church in Corinth, but their heart was very different than the heart of those who were part of the church in Corinth. Their socioeconomic status was very different from those who lived in Corinth. If you would go back to the passage with me and start from verse 2, this is what the Apostle Paul says. Actually, let's start from 1. He says, uh, brothers, we want you to know about the grace of God that has been given among the churches in Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their needs, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. So he says, look at these people. Their reality is different than yours, although their faith is the same as yours, and they gave very generously above and beyond So use that example and take that which they have done and be encouraged to do the same right now in your church. And historically we know that the generosity of the church in Corinth was activated because Paul brought to them this positive example of the church in Macedonia. You know, when you are generous, uh, you encourage others to be generous. When you act generously, others around you are likely to act generously. There's a study that says that altruism spreads in three degrees. Altruism spreads in three degrees. When you act generously, it affects threefold. Does that make sense? So the other day, I was about to catch a flight, showed up at the airport, kind of late already to catch my flight. It was one of those early flights. I don't know if you've been there, and my head was like popping because I hadn't had coffee. And uh, I'm, I'm going through the terminals, and I find a Starbucks, and I say, man, there's about five minutes till the boarding, but I need the coffee. So I'm going to stand in like that line was long. The line was long. I looked at the I sat stand in the back of the line, and I looked at the cashier, and we were very, very far away from each other. I said, I'm going to stay here. 
And, you know, I was standing in line, and not only was my head hurting, but halfway through the line, my stomach started growling. And now I'm hungry because this thing is taking too long, and I'm about to miss my flight. And finally I get there, I guess maybe after 12 minutes or so, and I said, hey, I, I want a coffee, and I want that, uh, that uh, ham and cheese croissant. And then she yells to somebody else in her staff, this is the last croissant. The guy behind me says, no, that's my croissant. I've been standing in line for 15 minutes for that croissant. And then I acted out of character. I said, sir, would you like to have half of it? <laughs> and he paused for like 10 seconds and he said, uh, sure. And so I got my croissant. She warmed it up. I got my croissant. Got that little plastic knife that they have there. I cut it in half. And we talked for about a minute or two. Where are you going? What do you do? Thank you. I appreciate that. We, went, we, we each went our way. And I boarded my plane because it was now late, 10 minutes. So God had arranged that whole moment. And I was thinking, I sat in my chair, you know, put on my seatbelt, and I was thinking, wow, <laughs> I thought the natural thing for me to do would have been to say, I've been waiting 15 minutes as well. Now, this is my croissant, but yet I acted out of character, and I was thinking, why? Why did I do that? And I remember that the day before, I went to the car shop because a nail had gone through my tires, and the guy in the, in, in the, in the shop, he fixed my tires, and I said, well, how much does it cost? He says, don't worry about it. I know you're a man of God because he saw my Bible sitting on the passenger seat. See, I know that it was because I had received generous, generously the previous day that I had been activated in generosity the following day. And what I want to tell you here today is this, is that one person can affect the generosity in dozens of people, even 100 people, because it spreads like wildfire. And if we want to see God moving in our community, if we want to see God moving in our city, generosity has got to be activated. There's no other way. There's no other way that God can get to people. There's no other, no other way that the needs of people, spiritual needs, the physical needs, the social needs of people can be met unless you step out in generosity. And there's no way that this neighborhood, that this village, that this island, that the city can be changed unless we build a culture of generosity because generosity is contagious. There's power and generosity. But there's something truthful about generosity as well. There's a truth about generosity that we must acknowledge. And that is this, is that generosity is not about the quantity of resources, but the quality of the heart. It's not about the quantity of resources, but about the quality of the heart. I come across a lot of people especially when we launch these campaigns at Crossbridge or, you know, when people start coming and attending and committing to Crossbridge, they say, Pastor, I would love to be more generous, but I just don't have enough time. Pastor, I would love to be more generous, but I don't have enough resources. If I had a little bit more, for sure, I would give more. If I had more time, I would give more time. If I had more money, I would give more money. I believe in the vision. I want to be utilized by God, but I just don't have enough. And let me tell you something. I don't buy into that because generosity is not about the quantity of resources, but the quality of the heart. Uh, studies have shown that as income increases, generosity actually decreases in people's lives. There's a study that I put my hands into recently that says this. Look, that people that make Fifty to seventy thousand a year give seven point six percent. People that make one hundred to two hundred thousand a year give an average of four point two percent, and people that make two hundred and above give two point eight percent. And you can think about yourself and apply this principle in your own life. You say to God, God, if you increase the capacity, I will increase in generosity. That's not true. If you look at it in your own life, the more you have been given, the less you have given. 
The more you have received, the less you have dispensed and dispersed. Think about that. And you're, when you, uh, as a strong believer, you got your first job, you're just like, I'm going to tithe, a full tithe. Tithe is a 10%. By the way, that's the prescription of the Bible. Like sort of like a base standard for those who have faith in Jesus Christ, who are part of God's people, who want to see God use them and their communities in the world for redemptive purposes. God says, I want you to carve out about 10%. And I don't want you to think that you're giving me 10%. You're returning to me that which I already given to you. And that ought to be the base standard of your life. But think about that. In that first job of yours, you carved out 10%. The more God has given you, the less you have given. I guarantee that that's been the case in most of your lives. Because the truth is that when income increases, generosity decreases. And those who have a relationship with Jesus, though that's those that have been called by God, who desire to be called by God, should not approach generosity with this type of mentality. I want you to prayerfully consider building margin in your life. Like God is saying to you, he's saying to me, he's saying, hey, I want you to build a little bit more margin in your life. And this margin that I want you to build in your life will not come by increasing income. It's not like thinking, hey, God, what else can I do to increase the income so I can be more generous? No. It's not about increasing the income, but stretching your faith, increasing your faith. The saying to God, I want to I wanna test you. I want to increase my faith. Father, I, I don't have faith to give 1% more. <laughs> I don't have the faith to be generous with my time one hour more. During the week, but I want to increase that capacity. I want to increase my margin. I want to look at the ways in which I'm budgeting my time. I want to look at the ways and how I am utilizing my gifts. I want to look at the way in which I'm spending my money, and I want to ask the question what is not necessary that I am doing? And I want to eliminate that and create margin so that I can live this life of radical generosity that God has called me to live. That's the truth about generosity. Now, there's a secret to generosity. A secret to generosity. And the secret to generosity is a threefold secret. The first one is this, and I'm going to tell you. Sometimes I have to be very careful when I bring this up because I don't want to sound like uh, that, you know, God always gives you more Always, every single time, when you give. But here's what the Bible is really clear about. The Bible is clear that God rewards generous givers. God increases the capacity of those who faithfully step into a lifestyle of generosity. One chapter later, a chapter later, the Apostle Paul uh, says this to the church in Corinth, still in the same letter. He says this, you will be enriched in every way. Because we're talking about generosity in every way. So he says, if you are generous, I will increase your capacity. I will enrich you in every way to be generous in every way, which will produce thanksgiving to God. Many of us, let me tell you something. I want you to listen to this. Many of us are not living a life of abundance because we have opted to live a life in scarcity. Okay? What is a life of scarcity? It's a life that is lived with the perspective that you never have enough. The glass is always half empty. That's a life of scarcity. A life of abundance is a life that sees the positive, that looks at everything with the glass half full, that I have received much more than I deserve, that God has been more gracious and more generous and more merciful, much more than I deserve. 
I am undeserving, and he's still faithful to me. I am unfaithful. He is faithful. People that live lives of abundance, the Bible says they reap abundantly as well. Because God, the Bible says, loves a cheerful giver. It's like children, when you have kids. When you have kids and, you know, obviously you give gifts to your kids, you give presents to your kids, you like to do that because you're a parent, you like to see them happy. But when you give gifts to your kids and that gift becomes a motive of dissension amongst the siblings, when they disregard it and they set it aside and they break it, they don't care for it, that demotivates you to give. But when you see kids that care for the toys and the gifts that you have given them, that are grateful and appreciative, that activates your heart towards more abundance and more generosity. And it's the same thing with God. I do not want you to live a, a life that's characterized by scarcity. I want you to live a life that's characterized by abundance. And the only way that you will live a life of abundance is if, if generosity is activated in your life. And that brings us to the second secret of generosity, and that is the fact that generosity, generosity produces joy in our lives. Let me say something to you. Even if God does not increase your time capacity, even if God doesn't increase your financial capacity, if you step out in faith and live a generous life, you will still overflow in joy, which is very interesting. You know why? Because the reason why we hoard our resources, the reason why we are stingy, the reason why we are materialistic is because we believe that the material, that comfort will bring joy and happiness into our lives. And those of you that have made a lot of money and have been successful in life or you've been at one season at the top, maybe you're down right now, but those who've been at that place before, those that can say, been there, done that, know that the accumulation of material resources do not bring you any security and any joy in life. And God is saying, what if, <laughs> think about this, crazy math. What if I can give you the joy, what if I can give you the security what if I can give you the comfort and the satisfaction that you are looking for, not by accumulating, but by giving? Not by retaining, but by letting go. And we're like, no, I, I can't believe that that's, that's, that's true. I mean, that math does not add up, Pastor. And that's what God is asking you to test him in today. And I know it's hard because that's not how our minds think. I know that's hard because that's not how we are trained to live in the culture in which we live in. But it is true. It is true. That the more you give, the happier you will be. That's why Jesus said it's better to give than to receive. See, the Macedonian Christians, they were broke. They were poor. That's what Paul says. And yet, they had this unending joy in their life. In fact, in verse 2, he, he literally defines this an abundance of joy. Not because they had material resources, but because they were generous people. Because they were generous, they were the happiest of all. And that's not only what the Bible is saying. You're saying, yeah, that's all religious Christian talk. I've heard that before, Mo. Science is actually proving that today. There are many books that are written by actually atheists, non-Christians, psychologists that are saying that the happiest people that they come across in their research are the ones that live a generous lifestyle, a radically generous lifestyle. 
I said this a couple of weeks, and it's true, like it's also a, 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 a product of a study, that uh, generosity, generosity activates a part of your brain that's only stimulated by sex and food. <laughs> Who likes sex and food here? Who's stimulated by sex and food? Generosity stimulates, it releases endorphins. It releases all sorts of hormones and, and to your bloodstream that gives you that pleasure of satisfaction. And you will be happier if you give. Because Jesus was the most joyful, the happiest human that has ever lived because he was the most generous human that has ever lived. There's an old sermon by an old Scottish preacher, Robert Murray McChain, where, where he says this, he says, Oh, dear Christians, if you want to be like Christ, give much more. Give often, give freely to the vile and to the poor, the thankless and the undeserving. Christ is glorious and happy, and so you will be. It's not your money I want, but your happiness. Remember his own words, it is more blessed to give than to receive. See, God, look, God has your best interest in mind. A lot of us think that God wants to cut the fun of our lives out. <laughs> no, God wants you to be the most happy, the most fulfilled person, but he's saying to you, look, you have to see things as I see. Instead of closing your fist, you have to open your hands. Instead of closing your arms, you have to open your arms. I do not want cut to cut off on your fun. I want to give you more joy and more happiness in abundance so that it would overflow in your life and it would overflow to others as well. So, how do we unlock generosity in our lives? That's a secret too. Generosity's secret is that uh, God rewards generous givers, that you will be happier if you live a generous life. But he, what's the secret of unlocking this generosity in our lives? And I want to call your attention to verse 9, which was the last verse that we read. In verse 9, the Apostle Paul says, this is his closing statement pretty much. It's the, the closing ask, if you will, to the church in Corinth. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty may become rich. You know, the beautiful thing that Paul does here is that he does not coerce people to give. He, he doesn't say, if you don't give, God's going to curse you. <laughs> Maybe some of you have come from church backgrounds where you've heard that uh, if you do not give, God will unleash the locusts in your life and it will destroy your fields and destroy your life. He will punish you if you are not generous. And so some of you said, oh, I'm going to give because I'm afraid. I don't want that to happen to me. And your generosity is activated out of fear. <laughs> And as long as there's fear, there's generosity. But when you're no longer afraid, you stop being generous. Paul doesn't do that. Paul doesn't uh, guilt them into giving either. He doesn't say, look at you guys. You're so rich. You have so much. And people have so less. How can you live with yourself? <laughs> he doesn't do that either. He doesn't guilt them into giving. He remembers why they should give. He reminds them of the reason why they should give in the first place. He says, it's not so that you will receive in return from God. It's not that which is in the future. That should be your motivation for giving. It's not so that you would see God Use your life in a big way. Those are good things, and he will. He will bless you. You will be happier. He will use you. If you step out into faith and you say, I'm going to be more generous this coming year than this past year, 
He will, but that should not be your ultimate motivation. He says your motivation should be not because of that which is in the future, but because of that which is in the past. It's not about that which God will do for you, but what he has already done for you in Jesus Christ. When Paul says that, you know what he does? He doesn't move the mind or the will of the people, but he moves the heart. He aims at the heart. He's precise. And he says, you know, you know, don't you, the grace of our Lord? You know. You guys were poor. I was poor. I was spiritually bankrupt. And Jesus was wealthy. And he was willing to let everything go. He was willing to become poor for our sake so that you and I could become rich in him or through him. How do you unlock generosity in your life that is not temporary, but it becomes a habit that's lasting generosity? How do you unlock lasting generosity in your life and experience with the grace of God? See, unless you profoundly experience the creator God of the universe, putting all of his disposal, at your disposal, his most precious possession, which is the life of, yours, of his son, for your sake, generosity in your life will not become a habit. It will not be a lasting thing. It will be a temporary thing. Maybe you will be generous out of fear. Maybe you'll be generous out of guilt. But the only way you'll be generous out of love is when you experience the grace of Jesus Christ poured on out for you. And my prayer, look, my prayer today, my prayer this week for you is that God will show you, God will reveal to you, God will remind you of the riches of his grace and the gospel that has come to you. That he will remind you of your previous state of spiritual poverty and your current state of spiritual wealth and the way that has come about, which was at the cost of the life of his only son. And that you would want to identify with Jesus Christ in his sacrifice so that your generosity is also sacrificial. Yes, the 10% is a good thumb, is a good, a good a rule of thumb. The 10% is a good rule of thumb. The 10% is a good standard. The 10% is a good base that will guide you through the lifestyle and the principle of generosity and giving. But the new standard for the Christian is no longer the 10%, but the cross. <laughs> and so you must come to a point in your life where you're asking, God, how can I give till it hurts a little bit? How can I deprive myself of certain things so that others could have more of you and more of their needs met in their lives? How can I do that? How can the cross become a standard in my own life? Because I know, I know Christians that, you know, even if they give 10%, it does not make a dent in the way in which they live their lives. There's no sacrifice. They can do that, no problem. But Jesus is calling you to go beyond that, to identify yourself with his cross, because that has become the new standard for us. And that is my prayer for your life today. And I want to assure you, and God even says in another book of the Bible that you can test him in this, that if you step out into faith and you live a life of gen radical generosity, you will be blessed beyond your imagination. And God is calling you to that today. And so here's how I want you to respond to this. Silver is going to come back in a little while. I want you to take this card and as we are coming to the table, we're going to be singing and et cetera. I want you to say, God, help me to fill this thing out here today. Not with uh, the eyes of probab probability, but through the eyes of faith. How do you want to utilize me today? And whatever number he puts on your head of time and your talents and your treasure, you put it down in this card here. And you drop it in the offering plate as it comes around. And if you're not ready, you go home and you pray with your spouse and you say, how does God want to stretch our faith? Not just increase our income, but how does God want to stretch our faith in the following year? And I'm sure that if you step in there, in that gap, in that pocket, God will increase his capacity, your capacity to be generous even more. 
Let's pray. Uh, Father, we are grateful uh, because of the generous grace of Jesus Christ that has been lavished over us and has now become uh, the standard by which we ought to live our lives. Uh, Father, I know that there are some here today that are probably listening to uh, this type of teaching for the very first time. And I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would speak into their hearts as it has spoken to my heart and has spoken to the hearts of many of my brothers and sisters already. Uh, Father, even those who are not sure of where they stand when it comes to faith in Jesus, uh, Father, may you open their minds for more generosity than there already is in their lives so that there will be more satisfaction, more happiness, more fulfillment. And, Father, may that also unlock and open the doors for faith in their lives as well. Father, as we come to your table, we want to be reminded of how generous you have been to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.